uh, rich versus wealthy. Um, was, uh, Buckminster Fuller had said that wealth can be measured, real wealth can be measured in days. The amount of days that you can live with your normal lifestyle without drawing a paycheck. Profound. So a paycheck linked to you showing up to work or you working at your job um, through either businesses you own that, but you don't work at, um, through you know books that you've published, so on and so forth, intellectual property, whatever it is, or just you know the the income off of your vast holdings. Um, if that if the amount of days that you can perpetuate your normal lifestyle is infinite, ding, 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 you get the wealth, wealthy prize. If not, your wealth can be measured in days. So it's sort of an interesting way to think of it. All right. The next thing, getting back to this idea of working with angels and spirits and demons and things like this. Oh, my. Oh, my. Angels and spirits and demons. Oh my. Do not let spirits, gods, and this this is blasphemy what I'm about to say for some people. Do not let spirits, gods, demons, fairies, ghosts, non-physical entities of any kind run your life for you, any more than you would let another person run your life for you. There are very few people who are, you know, 24-7 BDSM submissives. Yet in the spiritual community, it's like, whatever you think, you know? And it's, it's like I said with Sakyo. It's not his job to have your perspective of what you want. It's, you know, you're turning over too much if you're saying, make me wealthy. And then what happens is, you you know, the next three things that happen, you're like, that was an opportunity sent by Sadhya. I have to take this. Because to do otherwise would be blasphemy. And it's sort of like, well, no, you got to say, hey, dude, that's not what I want. <laughs> Security guard at a psychiatric hospital. Security guard, yeah. I was toying with the idea of getting... Uh, a state job in New Jersey. Just, you know, I have kids, so I, obviously I have other income and I'm doing all right, so I'm not in any great hurry. But, um, you know, the, the idea of having uh, a state employment was attractive to me for benefits and things like this. So um, there was a little lie involved, and, you know, next thing you know, I get offered a, you know, uh, position as a security guard in a hospital for the criminal insane. It's like I realize that's the nature of your you know work, but thanks, but no thanks. For some people, that's blasphemy. That's like you know, well, the spirit just gave you something, and it's like, yeah, but if you just gave me something and I didn't want it, and I'd bring it back to the store, you know. It's not their job to run your life. It's your job to run your life. And this goes for, you know, all the way up the chain. There, the idea of turning that level of detail of your life over to another spiritual power, even to an all-knowing, all-powerful monotheist God, implies that you were given reason for no reason. It implies that you were given reason for no reason. That, that you were given reason and judgment and experience solely to go, here, I don't want this. You tell me what to do. That, my friends, is, in my opinion, BS. But magicians and witches do it all the time. I see it all the time. I, I, you know, I, one of the pagan festivals I taught at a couple of years ago, somebody's like, you know, well, I just expect the goddess to 
sort of take care of that, to show me where to go all the time. You're like, why? Where's that written? <laughs> like, where did that come from? I mean, I, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful to be dedicated, but, you know, um, don't let spirits run you. Third important principle. Emergency magic is bad magic. Now, this is something I get quoted on a lot for some reason. So some people um, have, you know, they bring up that I always say emergency magic is bad magic. But it's not to say that you should castigate yourself if you have to do emergency magic. I have done emergency magic, and I will do it again in the future because emergencies happen. What I mean by emergency magic is bad magic is emergency used only, I mean magic used only in emergencies is bad magic. How many people have heard you should not use magic unless all the mundane possibilities have been exhausted? Right? right? Mm -hmm. Here's the issue with that. There, there's a couple issues with this. On the philosophical issue, those of us that practice magic consider it a part of nature, right? right? So if it's part of nature, why is that one part of nature forbidden to engage in unless it's an absolute emergency, but all the other things are okay? In other words, if I'm going out on a date and I get dressed up in a suit that I would never wear except for a first date and choose a tie color based on what I you know, a friend of a friend told me she would like, and I, you know, take her to a restaurant that I, you know, found out a little bit about, you know, it's like, you know, well, she likes Indian food. Okay, well, I know a great Indian restaurant. Basically, do all these things to set up a situation where everything is just couched in the best possible way for me. What is okay about that, but not okay to use magic. Because here's the thing, even though I've said magic can influence minds, it doesn't influence mind any more than it influences probability. People say, well, you know, a spell on somebody will destroy their free will. Yes. yes. And we can see this because pagan festivals and magic occult conventions are filled with supermodels dangling on the arms of young Wiccans and magicians. Right? <laughs> no? <laughs> Damn! <laughs> I guess not. So it's, it's just another factor. It's just another factor. It's another influence. It's not evil. It's just not influence. Why do you practice, you know, why do you, in, in the editorial, mm -hmm. we practice magical things because we need to and we desire to influence our lives, hopefully, if we're right-thinking people, in the correct manner. Yeah. What's yeah. wrong with that? Right. We right. need to get over ourselves. Right. Now, I will say, in the case of, in, of influencing like a specific person, I, that you know, on a date, I would tend not to do that. Right. On, you know, to get it in ways, I would tend to be okay with that. Um, but, you know, other people that, you know, I know have done them. And, you know, I, I don't call them, like, you know, evil or something. It's because it is just another influence. It's not going to make or break anything. Um, so, so but, yes? To control someone or to break their free will? You're not breaking their free will. You're, you're, we're not talking about kidnapping somebody and, you know, brainwashing them for a week so that, you know, we're not talking about that level of influence. Candle spells, rituals, even, you know, summoning an angel or, or a spirit to influence somebody, it doesn't have that level of effect on people. Um, it can influence people one way or the other. But you're influenced every day by everything that goes on around you. Magic is just one further influence. I mean, my goodness, when you walk into an Abercrombie and Fitch, Everything from the placement, you know, there are, for instance, when you walk into an Abercrombie and Fitch, 
the, the stones in the walkway or, or the, the, the tiles are larger when you walk in and get smaller to lead you down certain pathways. The music is designed to attract a certain age group in and repel the older age group out so that they'll say, my god, I can't freaking stand it in here. Here's the credit card. Get your shirt. I'm gone. It's a level of influence. I, I would think like more like attraction in that you would attract like like minds. You know, if someone didn't have an interest in a particular product or person and you were able to influence them, that's some type of control. That's to me probably more like a bad magic person. Is is whatever Crummy and Fitch is doing bad? Imagine. Um, you can there are those who yes. believe that that's yeah. the case yeah. as yeah. advertising yeah. through the they 20th century. They want you to think that it's okay, so you think it's okay, because right. it's in your face every single day, so right. you accept it, but yeah. it's that's not, right. okay, now it's here's, not something that's all right. Right. here's the opposite. Here's, yeah. here's the opposite. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we go out on our first date. Rather than me dressing in the suit that I know you like, rather than me taking you to a place that I know you like, I'm going to dress in what I wore all day, a t-shirt, because I don't want to influence you towards my way. So I'm just going to wear the t-shirt I wore all day. And I am really don't give a crap where you want to go. I'm taking you to like the place that I like to go, which is, you know, the dirty water dog place. And, you know, and that's just the way it is. Is she not being influenced? Yeah, of course she is. You cannot influence. Yeah. This is the material the world. You cannot not influence people. By not by choosing to not influence people in your favor, you are almost de facto influencing them against you. Yeah. If you are going out for promotion at work and you decide, well, I don't want to, I don't want to do more work than I normally do. I don't want to present myself as better than I really am on a given day. So I'm not just going to not do a darn thing. Somebody else that's up for that promotion is going to get it. Mm -hmm. You are always influencing the world around you and being influenced by the world around you. Yeah, my favorite example of that, because I went through it, is parents who say they're not going to impose anything religious on the children and leave them to choose for themselves when they grow up. Well, I was getting the message loud and clear, religion is something shameful, you shouldn't talk about it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, you know, there is always this influence. But if, if I can move on, there is a technical reason to not only engage in emergency magic. And that is just simply that magic is an art. Magic is something that you work at to be good at. How are you going to get good at it if you don't ever use it other than the few times in life when the shit has, const has completely hit the fan? And then the third reason is because magic is not the all-powerful uh, thing other than extreme measures. Because it can only influence minds a little bit and can only influence events a little bit. By the time it's a it's an emergency emergency, it might already be too late. Um, you know, several times in my life I've been contacted by people either professionally or personally with businesses that are failing. And they're like, you know, could, could you help me out with some magic to you know? <laughs> And it's like, well, you know, <laughs> the Titanic has sunk. Like, you know, so you summon Zadkiel to stick with the same example, and Zadkiel says, well, you know, maybe I can help get out with a little less debt than you had. Maybe I can find a buyer for the business. Maybe I can help you move it or something like that. Or, but otherwise, no. Whereas if you were practicing magic strategically from the beginning, along with everything else you do, you have a much greater chance of success. Um, if you turn, you know, just from a purely religious standpoint, if you, you know, one of the most successful business people I know is a Catholic, 
And he goes just about every day. He doesn't stay for the full hour, but he goes to the, the temple where the... Uh, it's usually a separate shrine, either in the church or even apart from the church, where they have the the host. I forget what it's called. You know what? Monstrance. Yes, the monstrance. And so there's somebody there at all times because the 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 host has to be in the presence of another person at all times to truly be the host. And you know he'll go in and he'll prostrate and he'll pray. And he said, "This is part of my business." Plan. You know, this is part of my business plan. I do what I do in service. I'm not going to the saints when, oh my God, my you know, I'm about to lose my house and, and everything else. I'm going right at the start. Like, I'm, you know, we're going to take over a company. Um, please, you know, guide me, you know, let me know if this is the right thing to do, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, send whatever guidance, send whatever help, etc., etc., right from the beginning. And so that's from a purely, uh, you know, spiritual magic place, then, you know, but the same is true from a more technically oriented magic place, um, right from the beginning. Which brings us to uh, some of the technical aspects of building a magical strategy. So in my book, I talk about, um, I lay out very clear strategies for finding work, killing debt, so on and so forth. But <clears throat> the, the main principle is to always marry the magical and the mundane together. If you're a magician, if you're a spiritual person, if you're a mystic, they have to be married together. Because, like I said at the beginning, we've already made the step. We're, we're not monks, we're not nuns. If you want to become a monk or a nun or a wandering yogi, I can help you. I've got the number of monasteries, both Buddhist and, and Catholic. I've got the number of uh, Tom Brown's survivalist school down in the Pine Barrens by me, you know. You spend a couple of weeks with Tom Brown, you'll be able to just walk out into the woods with a knife and live, you know. Uh, that's, that's really renunciation. And even then, you have to deal with money. I mean, the monastery has to feed people. Uh, has to do good work, so you never really escape the whole money. But, um, so you marry the mundane and the magical right from the start. How do you do this? Well, I use what I call macro and micro enchantment. And all of the strategies in the book rely upon this interplay of macro and micro enchantment. So, uh, like I said at the beginning, Using the former example, you want to find a job, you open up your copy of Favorite Catholic Novenas, and you find um, that for employment, they recommend, um, I think they recommend Our Lady of the Miraculous Mount. Or you're a Buddhist, and you search through your sadhana book, and for finding a job, they recommend Yellow Zambala. Or you're a Hindu and they recommend Lakshmi, or you're a witch and they recommend Habandia, or, you know, everybody's got one. <laughs> so this is your macro enchant. This is your big enchantment over the whole thing. Spiritual power X, help me find a job. Now, if you're not into using spiritual powers, this could be, you know, a secret style intention, you know, the secret, I mean, by secret style, um, you know, intention where you create a vision board or something of what you want to occur and you focus on it every day. But it's the big picture. You're saying, help me get to here. I need to find a job that pays X amount. And please, like I said, don't forget the X amount. Because <laughs> otherwise, you know, yeah, it's easy enough to find a job. 
pays half of what you were making 10 years ago, but here you go. Um, so that's your macro enchantment. And that's, for most people, that's all the magic they do. For most people, that is the extent of, of doing a, we want something, we do a spell. We do a prayer, or a series of prayers, or, you know, we accumulate 10,000 mantras, which, you know, if you're working with um, a novena, then you're doing a prayer for nine days. If you're working with Zambala, then you're doing maybe 10,000 Zambala mantras, Om Zambala Gandaya, Pizma. Um, whatever it is, that's your overarching thing. And it's nice if it's something that you can keep going overall. That's, I love mantra work for that reason, because you can start it and then you can just keep it going until you get uh, to the final goal. Um, but that's not enough for me. I'm not satisfied with just the macro enchantment. I believe in micro enchantment. So what is micro enchantment? Well, micro enchantment is taking your goal and you break down the steps to that goal. Because every goal that's worth getting to has steps, right? Other than the, than the lottery, which we, we talked about before. You know, not good magic. Um, so you take those steps and you figure out how to blend the mundane and the magical together on that small level. So let's stick with the example of finding a job since Lord knows in this economy any one of us here could need to find a job at any given moment. <coughs> so what's the first thing that you do? You're out of work. What's the first thing you do? Gotta start sending out resumes. You'll be able to do electronically now. Yes, but what's the, the very first thing that you should do, in my opinion? Look for work specifically in the well, you figure out what kind of work you want. Well, yeah, you figure out what kind of work you want. Then. That's the one. Ask your friends. The first thing to do is the thing that a lot of people don't want to do when they lose job because they're afraid of losing face. They keep it kind of, you know, I don't want to even know I lost my job. The thing to do is to stand up and say, I lost my job today. Do any of you have a, you know, a line on a job? And here's why. Resumes, we send them out electronically. Um, you know, uh, you go on Career Builder, you go on Indeed, you go on all, I have a list of places to, to find, you know, specialized job hunting sites. That represents 20% of the job openings that are available in America. 80% of jobs are filled through word of mouth. They're never posted. I used to work in AIG, also in the personnel department, and it was two sources, agency and employee reference. That's it. Because they didn't, actually they didn't want to pay the agency fees, so they, they wanted employee reference. They used to call people that would come in with re resumes and leave them. They used to call them street people. That's it. That was their turn. You know, I at the time that I, I had no I had no uh, diploma when I worked for AIG. I got it, they I went in as a as a temp and they liked me. So, you know, my boss recommended me to get hired as an underwriter town. So I hate them. <laughs> I, you know what? I have, I, you know, I realized that they they were evil and they became an evil empire. Lord, uh, even my boss, when the credit defaults, like in 1999, when that law was signed, he was like, "It's like a, it's going to be a casino here." He's like, "Except casinos actually have to have the money to cover if the house loses." Um, but I I have a hard time hating them. I had a really good time with that <laughs> cheat. Great parties. Fifty <laughs> <laughs> years old. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, I was in my twenty, I was twenty, but um, so it was it was a good time. 
But anyway, uh, yeah, you know, 80% of job openings are interpersonal. So you have to stand up and you say to Facebook, you say to LinkedIn, you say to all everyone you know and everyone you know knows somebody, I'm looking for a job, help me out if you can. Now, how do you support that with Matic? So you've done your big overarching you know, spell, I'll use Tzadkiel or use the god Jupiter. Well, if you're using Jupiter, now it's the time to flip over the switch to Mercury. Mercury. So Mercury controls communications. And, um, you know, there are gods and saints of every tradition that talk about communications and getting word out and messages, messengers of the gods and, and so on and so forth. So please, you know, and, and this can be down to, you know, spirits. There are actually glyphs and, and spirits that I give in my course that are specifically designed to do this kind of um, word spreading um, where you know, help this word get out to the right people. So now you're doing your overall macro enchantment, but now you're doing a micro enchantment for this one step. Then the next step is your resume, like you had said. So you put together this resume. Now, is everybody, has everyone here in, in New York, you know, you have wonderful botanicas, you have originals up in the Bronx, and a bunch of stuff. Yeah. So everybody's familiar with botanica and, and like the type of magic, the hoodoo ATR magic that it represents, powders and oils, things like this. I remember a couple of years ago, I was sitting in on a list, and there are a few of these email lists where I'm very silent on, but I, I read them. So they were talking about, um, you know, resume magic. And they're arguing about like, what the best way to hoodoo your resume is. Mm -hmm. You know, and like I use oil, I put this um, mm -hmm. on each corner, and oh no, no, I use powder. And I had to chime in because I was like, okay, first of all, there, there are two big problems here. I said, the first problem is whatever magic you're doing must not, and this could be another principle of, of financial sorcery, whatever magic you're doing must not override the mundane effect. So, if I get your resume and it has oil on it, I think you're a slob. Like, you know, what did this guy do? He just like came from the chicken place, and, like ate some fried chicken, and then he handed me his desire for my resume, man. <laughs> like, not good. Yeah. Um, yeah, and envelopes with powder tend not to be received on that well either. Especially post 9 11. Right, you know, it, it, what's amazing, if you Google like envelopes of powdered courthouses, uh, I, there are dozens of them, and dozens of them, and they turn out not to be anthrax, they turn out to be like normal and powder. And they don't understand, because what they don't understand is people aren't mailing anthrax, they're mailing court case powder. Right. Right. So, you know, since 9 11, now this closes things down. But again, I'm just like, yeah, I mean, you can shake it all off and things like this. And, okay, it's worth the effort. Maybe you can mask it a little bit. But this brings me to point number two. Where are you applying for jobs? In a chess king in 1987? I mean, who hands in a physical resume anymore? This is not how it's done. You might hand it in at the interview, but, you know, for that matter, you'll shake hands at the interview, so you can transmit whatever in person that you want to do with that. Um, no, 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 no. So the, what I always recommend to people is you take a master copy of your resume. Now you can do whatever you want to it. You can spill oil all over it. You can draw symbols and powder. You can make it look like the most occult, demonic documents you've ever seen in your life. Put it on your own, singe the edges, make it look like ancient parchment, whatever you want to do. I don't care. You know, sex magicians can all over it and whatever they want to do. However you want to do it, it's all okay because you're not giving it to anybody. You're going to put it on your altar. You're going to put it on your altar, you're going to put a candle on top of it, it's like a petition. Except in this case, it's affecting all the other copies of your resume. 
So you say, you know, affect all copies, electronic and otherwise. And people get very anachronistic about that. They don't like, you know, I know some people don't even use lighters to light their candles because it's modern. It's like, well, where are you living? Come on! I mean, you know, bring it into the real world here. Um, so, you know, using a spell, saying affecting all other copies, electronic or otherwise. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with mentioning electronic in, in the wording of an invocation. Like, this is the world we live in. It's Mercurian, it's Uranian. Exactly! Come on. But there's, you know, there's people who like that, you know. It, it breaks up my Ren Fair idea of what witchcraft is. And that's really what it's all about. Matches used to be high tech. Yeah. <laughs> so your resume, if you were using planetary influences, 